And at this point, I was just so numb. I was like, it cannot possibly be worse than any of my previous reads. But I swear to God, my grocery shopping list looks more exhilarating and thrilling than whatever this was. And that piano scene, I'm sorry, what was that? I felt traumatized. I felt violated. So today I wanted to talk about the books that I read during this winter month, so my January-February wrap-up. And when I tell you there is a lot going on, totally brilliant, swoony five-star read, absolute duds, new releases which may or may not ended up being absolute duds, a couple of DNFs which I promised myself I will get better at DNFing books this year. So yeah, quite an assortment of books and without further ado, let's just get into it. First, let's talk about what I was reading in the month of January and January was a great reading month to be honest especially compared to February which we'll discuss a bit later. By the beginning of the year I was still in the middle of The Mockingjay by Suzanne Collins so this was technically the first book that I finished in 2024 and I'm not gonna elaborate on it too too much. I gave The Mockingjay four stars I believe. Overall I thought this was a decent end to the series. There were a couple of things that I wish were explored, developed a bit more. Just like Katniss didn't get as much spotlight and agency as she should have gotten and the love triangle was getting a bit tiring i'm not gonna lie and having read the entire series i still think that the first one was the best one it just had a totally different impact on me personally and yeah this was long overdue so i'm glad i can finally say that yes i have read the hunger game series all right next may i present to you my first five star read of the year which was part of your world by abby jimenez and this book it was just perfection i literally have no other words to describe it it's about alexis and daniel alexis is the smart city girl she is an er doctor and she also comes from a family of world-renowned surgeons and he's a small town mayor there is also a 10 year age gap between them and alexis is actually the one being older than daniel and they basically could not be more different from each other yet when they meet the sparks fly the chemistry is undeniable this book gave me literal butterflies. I couldn't believe that it was only, what, a couple of days into the year and I had already found like the perfect five, six star romance book, which I'm extremely picky with my romances, but Abby Jimenez did it again for me, man. She did it again. I have nothing even slightly negative to say about this book. Start to finish, it was executed perfectly. It was paced perfectly. Every decision that the characters made made perfect sense to me. No one had to sacrifice anything to be with the other person. It was romantic and emotional. I mean, what more could you ask for? There is also on-page descriptions of emotional abuse, so if that might trigger you, just be aware of it. But overall, if you're looking for a romance to read, I totally, definitely recommend Part of Your World. Then in January, I was doing reading booktubers' favorite books of 2023 challenge. I have an entire video dedicated to those seven books that I picked up, so in case you want to hear more about them, go check that one out. Here, I'm just going to quickly go over them. Foster by Claire Keegan, a short melancholic story about this little girl and her foster parents. Honestly, this story did not impact me at all. The only thing I enjoyed about it was its shortness. So yeah, I gave it two stars, I believe. Then I picked up Woman Eating. This was my first DNF of the year. I just felt like this wasn't something I would end up enjoying. It was one of those all vibes type of book which is not really my cup of tea so yeah i decided not to torture myself i dnf'd it around 20 percent mark or something as long as the lemon trees grow in this book we follow our heroine salama her life and struggles during the syrian civil war and this book surely elicited a ton of emotions out of me again if you want to know more the video in which i'm talking more in depth about this one will be linked in the description down below in a nutshell though i love the idea of this book what it was trying to do and to show to its readers. But I just wish some of the topics were explored a bit more in depth. So yeah, it just left me wanting for more. Another book that left me quite literally begging for more, for more romance in particular, was The Seven Year Sleep by Ashley Poston. This one involves a magical apartment that can travel back and forth in time, so seven years into the past or into the future. And our main characters basically end up meeting in this apartment. This is quite literally right person wrong time trope as the main guy is essentially from the past and the premise of it was so fun and the book itself was super 
Emily Henry-esque. So if you love Emily Henry, definitely check this one out. For me though, it ended up being 3.75 slash 4 stars. Had this one focused a bit more on our main couple and their relationships, had we gotten at least two more additional chapters dedicated to romance itself, this would have been a total 5 star read for me. Kindred by Octavia E. Butler, brilliant soul-wrecking novel about a black woman time traveling to a slave plantation in Maryland in 1800s, I believe. In my opinion, this is one of those books that everyone should read. Five stars. Finley Donovan is killing it. This was a cozy mystery slash dark comedy type of book and I did not end up loving loving it but I liked it well enough. I think it's a great entertaining read to just kill your time with a book if you need to. So yeah, three out of five stars. Love Theoretically by Ailey Hazelwood. This was my first Ailey Hazelwood book which I did not expect to love as much as I did. I enjoyed reading about Jack and Elsie and their rivalry and band and chemistry and this surprisingly ended up being a great contemporary romance at least in my opinion five stars right and then february came around which i already despised this month with my whole heart november and february i swear to god are the most depressive gloomy months of the year i don't know if anyone else feels the similar way or not so anyways february is already not my favorite but on top of that i felt like this was the worst reading month that i've had in a hot minute for a while there nothing i picked up was working for me so i have several absolute flops to talk about so let's just get into it I I guess. It all started out with me wanting to pick up something super fast-paced and action-packed. I was just in the mood to fully immerse myself into the book and, you know, forget about the real world. And No Exit by Taylor Adams was on my TBR for quite a while. I heard so many people raving about this one and recommending it as one of the best thrillers out there. Quite literally a must-read for the fans of this genre. The premise of this book sounded absolutely fantastic. We follow a college student, Darby who is stuck in this intense blizzard and the roads are impassable so she's basically forced to wait out on this highway rest stop. Besides her there are also I believe four other people trapped in this rest stop as well and when Darby goes out into the storm trying to find a signal and call home she sees this little girl trapped in an animal crate in the back of one of the cars parked outside so the entire book is about Darby trying to find out what the hell is going on and trying to essentially save this child. And you know what? First of all, this one is marked as a mystery thriller, but I'd say this is just a thriller because the mystery of it all disappears around 10-15% of this book. Like we literally find out who out of those four strangers kidnapped this child and immediately my interest kind of dropped because I truly do need there to be a mystery to keep me going to be fully immersed in this type of a book. But no, after that it was just full-on action, one thing after another. A lot of descriptions of who did what to whom and honestly one thing I found out about myself while reading this one is that I do not necessarily like these types of books. I would much rather consume this in a movie format when you can clearly see what is happening on the screen instead of having to read endless passages about it. And overall for an allegedly fast-paced binge-worthy book, No Exit just felt truly exhausting and never-ending. Like you think, okay, surely after this many events police is going to be here any second soon and we'll get some sort of resolution but no 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 then again something completely stupid and unbelievable happens and we are forced to read another 50 pages of darby our main protagonist trying to outsmart the villains that's another thing right the villains themselves were so over the top pure almost cartoonish evil like yeah it was not good i believe someone else pointed out on goodreads that all the twists and turns in this book relied so heavily on characters making stupid mistakes and I never agreed with the statement more. Yeah, I don't know, I kept reading it in hopes of finding out what it is about this book that has so many people obsessed but I never understood. For me it was a total flop. I believe this was my first one star read of the year. Oh, and also No Exit was quite gory and graphic. At times it was even giving me an anxiety so just keep that in mind if you for some reason decide to give it a go. Okay, then 
And Tia Williams' newest book, A Love Song for Ricky Wilde, was released. And I cannot begin to tell you how excited I was about it, especially after No Exit. I was like, okay, surely this will remedy the situation and I'm gonna have a fucking excellent time reading it. Oh boy, was I wrong. Honestly, I knew close to nothing about A Love Song for Ricky Wilde before I started reading it. And that might have been my first mistake. I just assumed that because I loved Seven Days in June so much that I would automatically enjoy this one as well. And if you read the official synopsis of this book, it's all kind of wake. Like we follow Ricky Wilde. She is a part of this super wealthy family. I believe they operate a chain of funeral homes or something. And she's basically an outcast in her family. She doesn't want to follow in their steps. She doesn't get along with her parents and her sisters, etc, etc. Then one day Ricky meets this old lady who invites her to rent the bottom floor of her house in Harlem, New York, and Ricky immediately jumps at this opportunity of a fresh start. She leaves her family behind and moves there to open a flower shop. In the same neighborhood of Harlem, she then meets this mysterious, handsome stranger who knocks her world off balance. And I don't think I can talk about this book without some spoilers, although in my opinion what I'm gonna discuss is not particularly a spoiler because I felt like it was pretty obvious from the very first page what this book and the story was about. But still, if you don't want to know anything about the plot of this book, just skip ahead. Timestamps will be in description down below. So essentially, this guy that Ricky meets is from the past. Again, I don't know if anyone was surprised when this was revealed because once again, this is pretty obvious from the page one. So yeah, because of this, the book kind of falls into the magical realism genre, which is not necessarily what I love, but okay, I was still willing to give it a chance because I thought, you know, this is Tia Williams, the woman who created Seven Days in June. So surely I would at least enjoy some parts of this book. And I did not. It was so insta lovey. Our main characters, Ezra and Ricky, they're supposed to be soulmates. And we are told multiple times that they have this crazy pull towards each other. But never once did I feel any actual chemistry or romance or love or anything between them. I guess this is the soulmate trope or something. Uh, yeah, I was not a fan. I mean, you cannot simply tell me that those two are meant for each other and expect me to be immersed in the romance. So that was probably the main issue for me. Like the romance was so dry and non-existent. And honestly, until the 60% mark of this book, we don't even get any actual memorable scenes between the two. And I had my issues with the FMCU Ricky herself. I just felt like she was this typical spoiled wealthy child. So much time in this book is spent describing how she doesn't fit with her rich family and it all sounded like first world problems of privileged people and her sisters as well were so poorly written. They were so over the top cartoonish and unnecessarily evil. Like the way they acted was so childish even though they were literally in their 40s or 50s or something. And that piano scene, I'm sorry, what was that? I felt trauma. I felt violated. Two things I enjoyed. I loved reading about Harlem and its history. Again, I'm not from America, so I had absolutely no idea that Harlem was this neighborhood in New York with such rich background. So it was quite fascinating and educational for me to read about it. So thank you, Tia Williams. And secondly, Eva and Shane from Seven Days in June make a comeback in this book. And can I just say that those two, three pages that they were in provided me with more feelings and butterflies than this entire book. Yeah, overall such a disappointment. I was so bummed because this was quite literally one of my most anticipated releases of 2024, but I ended up giving it two stars. Maybe it's not fair to compare those two books, but this one cannot even hold a candle to Seven Days in June would not recommend. Oh, and I forgot to mention that even before I picked No Exit, I gave The Fury by Alex Michael Edis a try and I DNF'd it at around 25-30%. Um, no, this was supposed to be a thriller, but I swear to God my grocery shopping list looks more exhilarating and thrilling than whatever this was. If you don't know, this man wrote The Silent Patient, which granted, people have quite polarizing opinions about this book. I personally quite enjoyed it. But regardless of your thoughts on that one, you cannot deny that The Silent Patient was truly a page turner. And The Fury, again, was nothing similar to The Silent 
silent patient. So we were promised a murder story of ex-movie star on this remote Greek island, which that sounded wonderful. Yeah, give that to me immediately. But instead of focusing on the murder itself, kept going on and on about all those people and their backgrounds. Like respectfully, I don't care, man. I don't give a flying fluff about those characters. Like, I get it. If he first hooked us in with the murder and then, you know, the characters were trying to solve the mystery and trying to find out who is actually guilty and then we got all those biographical details, all right. But this way, no, it was simply not working for me. I couldn't find a single reason why I should be interested in getting to know all those random people. So yeah, I just put it aside. Again, disappointing since this was another release I had been looking forward to. Anyways, if you read this one, should I push through it? Is it worth it? Let me know. And for some goddamn reason, I decided to just go ahead and pick up what happened to Ruthie Ramirez by Claire Jimenez. I mean, I know the reason. I heard Carrie talk about it in her reading wrap up and the way that she described it sounded interesting to me. And then I checked and I saw that it was quite a short read around 250 pages or something. So I thought, you know, why not? I've maybe thought twice. In this book, we are following Puerto Rican family, three sisters, and one of them, Ruthie Ramirez, disappears when she was only 13. And this, of course, takes a toll on a family. And years later, they're still trying to find answers to their questions. And one day, two sisters suddenly see her on this reality TV show, and they believe that she's alive after all. And they start thinking about how to get her back home. And I'm tired of being this negative, but I'm sorry, this was just not good. It was terrible in fact, so boring and disjointed and this book just was all over the place and I felt completely lost for the entirety of it. We get multiple POVs, Kruthi herself, her two sisters and her mother, but genuinely what was the point? Because all of them sounded so similar that they just blended into this one personality and this personality was not a pleasant one to read about. Like each one of them was so mean and rude for absolutely no reason to each other and to other people. There were these constant fights and conflicts, again for no reason at all, and by the end of the book no character development whatsoever happened for either one of them. And then I read somewhere that this book was supposed to be funny? Like, I'm sorry, am I the problem? Is there something wrong with my sense of humor or something? Like literally pinpoint me to the pages where I was supposed to laugh? I'm genuinely curious. Yeah, as you can see, I absolutely hated this book. The only thing that kept me going was this question, what happened to Ruthie Ramirez? And we don't get the answer until the very last page. So one star, moving on. All right, let's wrap it up with something positive, shall we? The last book I picked in the month of February was Fast by Millie Belizaire. I hope that's how you say her name. This book was not on my radar at all. I heard Heather talking about it in one of her reading vlogs. And at this point, I was just so numb. I was like, it cannot possibly be worse than any of my previous reads, so let's just give it a go. And this, finally was good. It was a decent romance book, but it's also a very dark book with a lot of difficult topics at its heart, so just be aware. Our FMC Caprice is sent to live with her grandmother and her uncle after the death of her mother, and the book is told in three different parts, so we follow Caprice from her very childhood all the way to her late 20s, I believe, and during her childhood Caprice unfortunately goes through abuse in her household, so the book is focused quite heavily on that aspect, and this was really Really devastating and heartbreaking to read, but I thought it was executed well. Both the story of Caprice and the children that we meet later on in this book is handled and described with a lot of nuance and understanding. And since this is a romance book, there is obviously a romance in this between Sean and Caprice. They are this childhood friends to lovers, and their romance was quite unproblematic and wholesome to read about. The only thing is I felt like this was maybe a bit drawn out, especially in the last 30% of this book. I mean, the book itself was 420 pages. And again, romance writers, for the love of God, we don't need romance books to be over 350 pages. We really don't. The writing could have been better too, but other than that, I quite enjoyed it. I gave it 3.5 stars out of 5, I believe. Last thing I'm gonna mention is that this book 
is not that popular. I think there is around 2000 or something reviews on Goodreads and I personally have never heard of this author before but she has other books as well but this one in particular I think is well worth your time especially if you're in the mood for a dark emotional and heart-hitting romance. And that's finally it. Those were all 14 books that I read in the months of January and February. Let me know what you were reading this winter and as always do let me know if you have any book recommendations for me in the comment section below. And if you enjoyed this video, consider giving it a thumbs up and subscribing to my channel to never miss an upload from me. And stay safe and I'll see you in my next one. Bye bye!